And I know as uh, our pastor alluded to, this is our Pentecostal Sunday. And you know, if you look at the book of Acts chapter 1 and verses number 8, the Bible talks about us becoming the witnesses of God. That is from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And I, I like how the New Living Translation puts that verse 8, that uh, the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you will receive power and you will go and tell everybody in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria about me. And even as we look at what God is calling us to do as a congregation, as a church, it is my prayer that as I bring this word of God to us, that God will speak to every last one of us. You know, every time we come to the house of the Lord, we come expectant. We come wanting to hear, what is God talking to me? What is God telling me as an individual? Because that should be your desire. That every time you leave your home, you leave your hotel, you live where you're coming from, you should be ready to receive from the Lord. And I know that this morning, there's something God also asked for us. We've been going through a series, and a very powerful series, which I'll encourage us to continue reading and also discussing in our small groups where we meet and just hear the heart of God. I want to read us a scripture from the book of 2 Corinthians. I'll be reading verses, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. I'm reading from New Living Translation. The Bible says, And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself, through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Verses 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them, and uh, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I love that last line. Where the Bible says, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I want to share with us this morning on uh, one of our topics, the church as a peacemaker. And I'm praying that God will speak to all of us. The church as a peacemaker. I was trying to look at the word peace just to get to understand exactly what is, what is peace. And I got this definition that really blessed my heart. Peace is freedom from disturbances. Peace is tranquility. Peace is a state or period in which there is no war or a war has ended. That is one of the definitions. There might be some other definition, but that's one of the definitions I got about peace. That free, peace is freedom from disturbance. When you are free from this disturbance, you can say, I'm at peace. I'm at peace with my wife. I'm at peace with my children. I'm at peace with my bosses. I'm at peace in our country. Peace, freedom from disturbance. State or period in which there is no war or war has ended. You know, war, war, war is everywhere. War is everywhere. In your office, there is war. In the market, there is war. In the family, there is war. In your relationship, there is war. 
So when, when, when that, you're in that state where the war has ended, you can say, I'm enjoying my peace. And I know probably this morning I'll be talking to somebody who is not at peace. You came here, but you're not at peace at all. I'll be encouraging you through the word of God because the word of God is active. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is living. And I also looked at the second word because I'm talking about the church as a peacemaker. There's a second word I also looked at and that is cohesion. This is a word that we have always been hearing because I'll be marrying the two, peace and cohesion, just to understand what is, what is God telling us. And I came up with this definition from one of the dictionary. The act or state of sticking together tightly. Unity we always talk about. So when, when we say there's cohesion, we are saying there's unity. People are sticking together. People are in that state of sticking together tightly. And uh, as we look at the scripture where we have just read, I'll be helping us to just look at two things. The facts about being an ambassador and what we ought to do as ambassadors. Because if we get the mind of God from the word of God, that also becomes a blessing. But allow me to give this introduction just from our, our sharing. It is true that the church is called upon to promote peace and cohesion in the nation. I've already given the definition of peace and cohesion. That peace is that state when war is ended. Cohesion is when we are tightly joined together. We are living in unity. The church is called upon to promote. So our work as a church is to promote that, that tightness, that unity. That living together is very, very important for us as a church to take that as the mandate God has given us. Reverend Dr. Samuel Cobia, talking on this subject, said peace and cohesion is central to the call and ministry of the church. And I've underlined the word central. Peace and cohesion is central to the ministry of the church. In other words, if we cannot do that, we are missing something very, very important. And that's why Jesus told his disciples, you will not leave Jerusalem until you are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And then you will go out and tell everybody about what I've done in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Because there's no way we can promote peace and cohesion if we don't get the mind of God and what God wants to do with us. There's somebody by the name Candy who said something I've quoted here. While we can fix all the injustices of the past, we can resolve to think and do differently in the future. In other words, Scandi is trying to tell us we can make a resolve and say, yes, things happened badly yesterday. Things don't, didn't go in the right direction yesterday, but we can do it differently in the future. And this is a call that God is calling us as a church that can we really resolve to think and do differently in the future by embracing peace, by becoming peacemakers. We make peace. We do that which is in the heart of God. So we are saying we have been called to promote. We are saying peace and cohesion is central for any church, for any ministry. I've been looking at the number we have here in Sita Meldorate, both first and second service, <coughs> and I've been asking myself, are we really peacemakers? Because I was asking myself, with this number we have, children, youth, teenagers, the 1,500 we are talking about, are we peacemakers? Are we making peace where God has planted us, where God has placed us? Because I know you are not where you are by accident. You are not in that office by accident. You are not in that tribe by accident. You are not in that place by accident. God has planted you there for a purpose. And the purpose God has planted you for is to promote peace and cohesion. Somebody say amen. With the neighbors you are living with, you know them, you understand them. But 
Do you, do you resolve to think of doing things differently with the people around you? When you meet as a, as a, as a group, as a tribe, do you resolve to think and do things differently? Because that is very, very important. Because we are talking about how can we promote peace? How can we be central in, in peace and cohesion in the time we are living in? Because that is something that is very, very critical. And I want to say this, church. We are mandated, not by Pastor Ibrahim, not by elders or pastors or bishops. We are mandated by God to bear his offer of reconciliation to a world that is alienated from him, to a world that is far from him. We have a mandate. I have a mandate. You have a mandate. Because if we don't carry out our mandate, we will still be in war. The war will be still going on. But we want to reach a place where the war has ended. Wives and husbands are not fighting. Children and parents are not fighting. Bosses and their, 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 their juniors are not fighting because there's peace already. People have been reformed. People have been transformed. Something has happened inside them. And this will only call upon us to understand that we are mandated by God. Somebody say amen. Tell your neighbor you are mandated by God. Please don't forget that. When you see a neighbor fighting a wife and you are there and you cannot take even a step to go and knock and say, brother, sister, what is the problem? You're failing on your mandate. When you see things happening and you're just quiet as a child of God, somebody who knows that has been mandated to do something, there's something wrong somewhere. The Bible is very clear from where we just read that as a church, we are mandated by God to bear his offer. There's an offer God has, has given freely. An offer of reconciliation to a world that is, a linear, uh, that is separated from him. There are people who are drunk and you know them. There are people who are living careless life and you know them. You have a responsibility. You have a mandate to go and offer them this ministry of reconciliation. The entire gospel... Narrative is characterized by this offer and proclamation of peace. Telling people about peace, about what God can do. Jesus Christ himself is the prince of peace. If you read, read Isaiah uh, chapter 9, you'll see that Jesus is the prince of peace. And we have been, we have been offered this mandate to go and make proclamation of peace. Last week we were talking with uh, Chief, Chief uh, Korir. We were somewhere and Chief was telling us what they go around as chiefs outside there. And he was trying to tell us that what we do as pastors and chief is not very, very bad, very far. Because chiefs meet with issues. Somebody has raped somebody. Somebody has impregnated somebody. This and this has happened. And he was saying, Pastor, if you are not called into that office of a chief, you can't really do what God wants you to do. And I remember telling him, you people also carry the message of reconciliation we are carrying. It is a plus when you're a chief and born again because you'll do a lot of reconciliation. Somebody say amen. So we are saying the entire gospel narrative is characterized by God's offer and proclamation of peace. And when we have this understanding, this will really bless us. You know, as we look at the life of Paul from the book I've just read, Paul was motivated by certain things. The motives that control Paul's life and ministry, if you look at the chapter I've just read, that is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to, to 21, you'll see that this man of God, was controlled by certain motives, which were very, very clear. He had confidence in heaven. He knew, yes, I'm living in this planet Earth, but I'm not of this world. Yes, I'm a citizen here, but I know where I'm going. I'm a citizen of heaven too. And this motivated him in his life, in his ministry. So whatever he was doing, he had that confidence that a day is coming that I'll join my father in heaven. Paul was concerned to please Christ in whatever he was doing. 
And if you look at the teachings of Paul and how God, Paul brings his teaching out, you'll see a man who was so much concerned to please Christ. He's talking about, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we desire for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So he's talking, but his concern is to please God. That when I'm, wherever I am, am I pleasing God? In my conversation, in my talks, in my attitude, am I pleasing God? That is the motive that controlled Paul's life and ministry. Paul was a man full of love. He had constraint of love. Is a man who was moved by love. This vocabulary called love is running away even from the church. It is going away. But Paul was controlled by this. Everything he was doing was out of love. And also, he was controlled by the commission from God. He knew that there is something God has called him to do. And that's why I'm zeroing around this morning as we talk about peacemakers. Paul knew very well that I have a commission. There is something God has called me to do. No wonder he's saying from verses 18 where I just read. And all of this is a gift from God. Who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. He knew he had a commission. He knew he had a task. God had given him a gift. And that gift was to be used. The gift of reconciling people to God. And the gift was this. You are God's ambassador. Somebody say amen. We are God's ambassadors. And we cannot run away from that. We have been given a ministry. We have been called by God to go and reconcile people to him. I was trying to look at this issue of, 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 of we as ambassador. And I was asking myself some few questions here and there. But there's something that I ask myself. The enemy of peace what is that enemy of peace? As I was looking at this issue of me becoming an ambassador, why don't we have so many ambassadors today who are reconciling people to God? And I realized we have an enemy of peace. And the greatest enemy of peace is a breakdown. Breakdown of the relationship with God. When our relationship with God is wanting, when our relationship with God is questionable, then that will be the biggest, biggest enemy of peace. Sometimes we pray, we say so many things, but if our breakdown that relates us with God is down, we are finished as a church, as an individual. Because what will make us enjoy that peace is how we relate with God. As Pastor Ibrahim, if I relate well with God, I will not have to think of bad things. I will not have to fight somebody. I will not have to go and steal because my relationship with God is very clear. But when we have a breakdown of the relationship with God, this leads to many things that we see. Yes, we can be praying and saying, oh, people, let's pray for this place. But if the breakdown is there, we still have a long way to go. You know, as I was preparing, I was saying, God, can you raise men and women who are ready to take the offer of reconciliation and begin reconciling people? Because that's the main thing. When we reconcile people, when you see people coming together, even angels in heaven are happy. Somebody say amen. Have you ever been to a place where things are tight? People don't know what to do. But God gives you the grace and wisdom. You go sit with these people. And then you see the healing that comes out of that kind of a talk of relationship. And the peace that God releases in such a place. I tell you so powerful. And I want to encourage all of us. You don't need to be a pastor to have a ministry of reconciliation. Did you hear what I've said? You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be an elder in a church or even an HOD 
to have the ministry of reconciliation. This is an offer God has given any child of God who is born again. Who is living as part of the standards of God. Because if we don't do this church, we'll be praying every other year. God, we want peace. God, we want peace. But peace will only be experienced when people have a good relationship with God. Somebody say amen. When the husband is not coming in the house drunk, they come, they greet, they hug, they enjoy life. When children are not engaged in drug, whatever, they come and uh, things are happening. Because already there is a relationship with God. And because of the relationship with God, things, the war we are seeing, the war we are fighting every day, my husband, my wife, my child, my boss, will already be a forgotten thing because something has happened in our relationship with God. And I'm here to en encourage you, child of God. The many things we are seeing happening today in form of war, in form of corruption, in form of killings, in form of anger, etc., you can mention them, is because of a breakdown of relationship with God. If people can just come back to God again and accept this offer that God is giving them, I tell you, we'll enjoy what God can do for us. Somebody help me say amen. I'm praying, and this is my prayer as Pastor Ibrahim, that God will help me to restore the broken relationship with him and with one another. Because if that doesn't work, then I don't know where I'm going. As we talk about this relationship that breaks down, every time there's a breakdown of relationship, there are certain things that are obvious. This matter of tribalism, we always talk every other day. Instead of seeing the variety, God of variety, we look people on the basis of tribe. It's because of a breakdown of stereotyping, a breakdown of not knowing what God is calling us to do. Now, I was telling some people the other day, tribalism, to be in a tribe is not bad. But the bad thing is that when I'm a Luo, I see a Nandi as a devil. When I'm a Nandi, I see a Kikuyu as something different. This is because probably my relationship with God is wanting. When I begin stereotyping other people, that you know those people, these people, we are all made in the image of God. And we were created by God. We just found ourselves where we are by the grace of God. So why should I begin stereotyping somebody? Why should the corruption be the main thing? If I'm a born again child of God, if my relationship with God is clear and good, why should I be involved in corruption? The wars we hear in Baringo, we hear in Keio and the killings, the main thing is a breakdown of relationship with God. You find that even church, church leaders, people who are leading, the frontline guys, I also engage in, in, in what they are not supposed to be engaged in. Instead of becoming the voice of reconciliation, they are also supporting their different group to make sure that things go the way they want to go. A breakdown of relationship with God leads to sacrifices to satanic altar. Many times when people are not in good terms with God, people do crazy things. You find you're a Christian, you want to go and visit a witch doctor. You find you're a Christian, you have to slaughter a cow for you to be cleansed on certain things. So there are funny things that happens when people are not related well with God. And that's why I'm encouraging us, boys and girls, men and women who are here, it is important to work on our relationship with him. Somebody say amen. A lot of people are walking in darkness. Because the relationship with God is broken down. But I want to challenge you. God is calling us and telling us, I've given you a gift, a gift of reconciliation. You are my ambassadors. Where you find yourself, you're my ambassadors. Now looking at the enemies of peace. And... Uh, 
this author called Candy gave a number of enemies, not enemy, the, 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 the single enemy is the breakdown of relationship with God. But now there are many enemies that comes as a result of not having a good relationship with God. The issue of prejudice, preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. You are prejudiced against people from different backgrounds. That comes as a result of our relationship with God. And it becomes one of the enemies of peace. Assumptions. A thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. You don't have a proof, but you're just assuming that this has to happen. This is how things need to happen. That is very, very dangerous. And met expectations. Sometimes people have different expectations. Somebody is saying, I know tomorrow this is what is going to happen to me, but that thing doesn't happen. You find things will not be in order. There will be some tension here and there. Because when you look at expectation, we are talking about a strong belief that something will happen or be the case. Something must happen. This has to happen. I have to get my way through. That is expectation, but sometimes it can be the enemy of peace. Because when you, you have a lot of expectations that are not met, you'll begin fighting. No men, majority of us here are married. Maybe the wife has a lot of expectation, or the husband has a lot of expectation to the wife, and, and, and then these expectations are not met. You'll find peace will not be in that house. The husband might not talk with the wife for one full week or even two weeks. There are people even who don't talk for one month. I've been counseling some people. One full month, you're in the same room. Unaleteo chai, unakunyo, unachomoka. Jioni, the same, just like that. That tells you there was some expectation that were not met. And because these expectations were not met, you find peace is lacking. I'm using that analogy of a house. Peace is lacking in that home. Anger. Anger also is another enemy of peace. Anger is an emotional characterized by antagonism toward someone or something. And you feel very bad. Excessive anger is something that is dangerous. To be ang angry is not bad. Even the Bible says, make sure kikasirika don't kasirika until the sun goes down. Make sure, if you're not talking with your wife today, in the evening, before you go for, 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 for rest, please call each other for kamkunji and say, please, sorry for what happened. Somebody say amen. Because that's what God is calling us to do. Because anger is the greatest enemy of peace. And there are people who are always puffed up with anger. They are puffed up with anger. They can't talk. Or they can even forget that this is my wife, this is my child. You just look at your wife like this, and you say, God, I've eaten well. Let me tell him that I'm a man in this house. That is very dangerous because of anger. And imagine a man who is seated here. You slap your wife. You beat your wife. Or you tell him something that makes her Feel like something is coming out of ourselves. I tell you, that house will not have peace. And God is calling us to be peacemakers. Negativism. The practice of being or tendency to be negative or skeptical in attitude while failing to offer positive reviews. Views. There are people who are always negative, negative, negative. But they are not offering any positive views on what should be done. That is the enemy of peace. Why should you always be negative? Negative about this. Negative about this. Negative about this. When there is something wrong, please come out, talk to the person, and tell the person, can this be done like this? Because that is important. But when we miss to understand the mind of God, we are missing something very, very important. Negativism is a dangerous enemy for peace. That if you see Pastor Ibrahim here, you say, no, useless fellow, useless guy. 
Because in your mind, you have that tendency to be negative, to be skeptical in your attitude. You're saying, no, that, that lady can't be a blessing to me. And because of that, you find people are together, but their tension, a lot of tension because of negativism. The guilt that we always have, the fact of having committed a specified or implied offense or crime. You, you're just guilty, guilty. Many people are lacking peace today because they are guilty of what they did. But God is calling us who are born again. Can we go and reconcile these people to God? And as we reconcile them back to God, something will happen. Somebody say amen. As ambassadors, the message was one of peace. Our God has paid the price of sin and God wants us to be involved in doing the work he's called us to do. You know, when sinners come to the Lord, the heavens rejoice. When people come to the Lord, the heavens rejoice. I'm looking for that time when we'll be having testimonies as a church. That pastor, there was this family that has been fighting for the last six months. But by the grace of the Lord, today we have come to church. They are living at peace. Pastor, there's this young boy who was so much in drug addiction. But pastor, after working with this young man, today the young man is coming to church and he loves God. I'm looking at that time because even heaven rejoice when sinners come to the Lord. Somebody say amen. And this cannot happen unless we accept the offer of reconciliation and say, God, I want to be that ambassador you are calling me to be. Somebody say amen. I want to finish by these two points, the facts about ambassadors because you are an ambassador. How many believe they are ambassador in this church? Some of us still don't know where they are. We want to look because we were looking at what Paul is saying that God has called us to this ministry of being in the office of an ambassador. And we want to look about certain facts about ambassadors so that when you leave this auditorium, you are going out as a representative of the kingdom of God. You know that I'm representing my kingdom. I'm representing the kingdom of God. Ambassadors are chosen. You cannot just wake up one day and say, I want to be an ambassador. The president of the nation must choose you. And you have to be chosen by God by accepting Jesus into your life. When you accept Jesus, you become an ambassador. Paul was chosen by Christ to be his representative. He did not present himself. And the message he was giving was the gospel of Christ, which Christ had commissioned to him in trust. And he was told, now I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. So ambassadors are chosen by God. The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 2 and verses number 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men but God who examines our hearts. Listen to that statement again. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, boys and girls, men and women who are here, we have been entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not to please men, but to please God. Somebody say amen. Listen to me, somebody. When you speak the word of God, when you talk the word of God, when situations are tough, when things are tough, and you go with the gospel of reconciliation, you'll be a peacemaker. Somebody say amen. Number two thing about ambassadors, ambassadors are protected. And this is something that should encourage you. That once you have been chosen by God and you have been given that ministry of reconciliation, the same one who has chosen you will protect you. 
Ambassadors must be a citizen of the nation he represents. I don't know which nations we represent. I don't know if I'm representing the nation of Luos, the nation of Kales, the nation of Kikuyus, the nation, but ambassador who has been chosen by God himself knows very well that he's a citizen of heaven. And because he's, he or she is a citizen of heaven, he will want to represent his nation wherever he found him or herself. Somebody say amen. I want to use, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an illustration yesterday I got as we were traveling from Mombasa. It's a good illustration. It's not a bad illustration. You know, when we were flying from Mombasa, our ticket showed that we need to go to Kisumu, direct. El Mombasa, Kisumu. But when we reached airport in Mombasa, they told us that this plane will go via Eldoret. But our ticket is reading Kisumu. We tried to argue, to argue, but it was not working. So in the plane, as pastors, we were talking. What can we do? Should we just, when we reach the soil of Eldoret, to Chomoke too? And as we are talking, we are talking, people are hearing what pastors are saying. They are hearing what we are saying. And I think God also helped us that uh, the crew, they, they call themselves what? A flight attendants. Overheard what we were saying. And when the, the plane landed in Eldoret, they said, everybody in this plane who is alighting should make sure you submit your ticket. I know our tickets are reading. Mombasa, Kisumu. Tukasema tumepatikana. That's another story. So we went to Kisumu, then came back. That's what happened. I'm trying to give an illustration there that it is good to know that we are citizens of a nation. It was a good idea to alight in Eldoret. But it was wrong to alight in Eldoret because our ticket was reading Mombasa, Kisumu. That was the right thing. Did you hear that uh, illustration? Paul was a citizen of heaven, just like all of us who are born again. And he says this in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, as an ambassador, you are protected. You should not have any fear. When you know you are doing what is right, you are protected. And when you know you are doing what is in the heart of God, you are also protected. And that becomes very, very important. So I say this with all humility, that our conversation, our talk is equated with citizenship. You can know which citizenship I belong to by the way I talk, by the way I react on issues. Because if I belong to this kingdom, there is a way this kingdom talks and does their things. If I belong to this kingdom, you'll just hear it from my conversation. Because conversation is equated with citizenship. If you get me so much boxed into abuses, into gossip, into rumor mongering, into cheating, you'll just know automatically which citizenship I'm representing. Because if truly I represent the kingdom, the heaven citizenship, whatever I say, you will realize that this man, this woman, belongs to the other kingdom. And that's what the world is looking for. In the marketplace, Christians who can say, this is not right, this is wrong. They want to see that. But when they miss that, they wonder what is not happening. The nation supply their ambassador with every need and stand ready to protect them. Likewise, we as Christians, Christ has supplied every need and is always there to stand with us in time of crisis. Somebody say amen. So never ever think of shortcut because you want to cheat your way to get where you want to reach. You are protected as an ambassador. Just do what is right 
Because Christ will provide the need you need. And because Christ is there to protect you, you'll enjoy what is happening in your life. Number three, ambassadors are held accountable. There is no ambassador working in any nation of the world who is not accountable to the country they are representing. They are accountable. If you're ambassador of the kingdom of God, you need to be accountable. And that's why you come to a church like Sitam. We have a structure. You're accountable to your pastors, to your HODs, to your elders, because ambassadors are held accountable. It is not a freelancer kind of a life. You need to give account of what is happening and the things that is happening. And if you have really presented your nation well, because ambassadors represent their countries and say what they are instructed to say. And we have instruction in the word of God. We don't need any other instruction apart from the word of God. Somebody say amen. That when you go to two people who are fighting, don't begin bringing your, the way you do it in your tribe. Take them the instruction. That this is what God requires of you. This is what God wants from you. And if you do it rightly, you're going to enjoy your peace. Because we need to instruct people from what we have been told to instruct them from. And Jesus is saying, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. Ambassadors knows very well that one day they will give an account of their work. Church, I want to encourage somebody here. A time is coming. A time is coming. Maybe not here. Yeah. A time is coming. We'll all stand before the Lord. And God will be calling names and saying, sister so and so, brother so and so, I gave you an, an office of an ambassador. How did you carry your office? That time is coming when we shall give an account. Number four, ambassadors are called home before the war is declared. Before any war is declared, ambassadors are called home. In other words, God wants us to live in peace. God wants us to enjoy peace. That peace we always quote, the peace that surpasses every human understanding. That is the peace God wants us to enjoy. And if God in his sovereign wisdom sees that my ambassador will be engaged in this war, God can call you back home. Because God wants you to enjoy peace. And we will not enjoy this peace if we don't take our mandate seriously. If we don't take our responsibility seriously. A day of wrath is coming, children of God. Boys and girls who are here. A day of wrath is coming that will judge the wicked. But Christians, we are called to do our part. Because that day when God will call us home. Will say, yes, Jesus, here I am. I've done my part. And I finish by asking this question. What ought we to do as ambassadors? What ought we to do as ambassadors? I've picked some four points from our manual that are very, very key. What ought we to do as ambassadors. And for the next five minutes, I want to hear from us. I'll pick some people randomly to help me preach this gospel. Because we are asking ourselves, what ought we to do as ambassador? One of the things that we need to do is we need to act as we saw blower. And I want to ask one of us here who is born again, how can you be a whistleblower as a child of God? Because that is very, very important. Yeah, so the Bible is telling us we need to be whistleblower. Not on the negative part of it, but on the good part of it. We blow against oppression, against injustice. Imagine you are coming from a neighborhood where parents are molesting their children, and you know very well that these parents are molesting their children. Or you come from a neighborhood where you know 
There is a mzee who is not faithful around here. Every time things are just happening, a true Christian will blow the whistle for the sake of that family. Because what we want to see is peace that comes from the Lord. And that's what we ought to do as children of God. Number two, we need to set and model the standards of right and wrong. We need to do that. We need to model. It might be painful. It might be hard. But we need to model the standards of right and wrong. I want to use my pastor a friend, Sir Judy. Judy was yesterday on fire. We must alight in Eldoret. We must alight in Eldoret. But I think God cooled, his, cooled her heart. And she cooled down. And I was just thinking about modeling the standards of right and wrong. It can be a good idea. But it's a wrong standard. It can be a good idea. But what we are doing probably is not right. So as a Christian, we need to set and model the standards of right and wrong. Because that is very, very important. Number three, promote equality and access to opportunities. Promote equality and access to opportunities. There's a word I borrowed somewhere. You should not be alpha and omega. You should not, as a child of God. Always try to promote equality. Always try to allow other people access some opportunities in their life. That's how you'll enjoy peace, because you're talking about peacemakers. When you are Alpha and Omega, people will be cutting you from behind. And they will be fearing you for no good reason. But when you allow people to, to get what they need to get, to access to certain opportunities that they need to access, I tell you things will be very good. Lastly, build human capacity, capacity for peaceful cohesion. This is something that we're encouraging all of us as Christians, wherever you find yourself. Maybe you're an, an HR manager. You are a CEO in that office, in your home. Please build human capacity for peaceful cohesion. Tell your children why they should love that tribe. Tell your neighbors why they should love that community. We need to do that like every other day because if we are truly ambassadors of God, we need to build human capacity for peaceful cohesion. From our two speakers who spoke, that is uh, Professor Lekayapi and Dr. Laktabai, they really talked about this issue of us just creating that op opportunity where people can live together, tightly together, without thinking about so many things because we are created in the image of God. And if we are created in the image of God, there are certain things that we need to do as Christians that are very, very key. And I say this with all humility as I bring this message to a conclusion. I know God is raising men and women of God in this church. Men who are saying, I want to be that person. Because the message of reconciliation is an urgent message that is needed today. Christ died on the cross because he wanted to reform lives. There are so many lives that are deformed today. But God is waiting for a man. God is waiting for a woman who will say, yes, Jesus, I'm ready for this ministry of reconciliation. I want to go and share this gospel of reformation because lives have to be reformed. Some of us, we are sitting here. We know the struggles we are going with our children. We know those struggles. But I'm saying we have a gospel here. The gospel of reconciliation. Somebody say amen. We have the privileged children of God of representing Christ and inviting people who are lost to receive him. That is a privilege God is giving us. And all of us as Christians, we are ambassadors of Christ. And don't sit down when you know you have been called to invite other people into the kingdom of God. Let's stand up as we pray together in the name of Jesus. <music>